you're like me, rest is not a good thing. I don't like to do it. <laughs> I find it hard to rest when there are things that need to get done, right? Because then my mind's just thinking about the things that I'm not doing or the things that means if I don't do it today, it's going to have to get done tomorrow in addition to everything else I have to do tomorrow, and that's going to be miserable, right? So it just, you're not resting, you're worrying. You're still not resting. Um, I was forced into a small period of rest. Um, my car needed some work, and it's needed some work for a while, but we finally, Nathan took the day off on Thursday for his birthday. He decided he was going to fix the car that day, and he took that day, and he took Friday, and he took Saturday. <laughs> So I was a little bit forced into a rest. I wasn't driving anywhere. I wasn't going anywhere. Um, Saturday, we had stuff to do here at the church, and he had to just come drop me off, you know? So I was, like, thinking i got to get it done this amount of times. So I don't want him in and out. I don't want him time to make multiple trips. I don't want to, you know, it's a, it's a whole thing. So I was forced into some rest. And, I, and I, I strongly believe that we can reshape our lives by how we perceive things. And lots of times our perceptions are encouraged by how we grew up, by how, what influences us, by our own life's experiences. And sometimes those things aren't so good. Sometimes there are some things that have um, tr changed us, some trauma responses that have changed us to give us a perspective that isn't necessarily accurate. Um, and, and that happens in our lives. Uh, for instance, one of, the, one of the biggest issues for me to reset my mind and, and think in a positive light and to think like God thinks and to see how God thinks was I saw this thing, I think it was on YouTube, it may have been on Facebook, but I saw this thing where this guy said, stop apologizing for everything. Stop apologizing, because if you apologize for everything, when you're legit sorry, you yourself are going to find trouble finding um, authenticity in that apology. Because you flung that word around. There is something going on with this speaker. I don't know if you can hear it. It literally sounds like a pop fizzing. Um, uh, anyway. So you legit, we, we apologize for everything. We're so concerned. And so our focus is either that people are upset with us, which is negative, or that we've done something wrong, which is still negative. And so the thought was stop apologizing and change every time you say I'm sorry to thank you. So if you're late, don't say I'm sorry I'm late. Say thank you for waiting on me. It shows the other people that you value their time, that you appreciate that they bothered to wait, and there's authenticity in that that's not there in the apology. And it acknowledges that you needed somebody to extend you a little bit of grace. You were late. It doesn't mean you're a terrible person. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. You may have had a, you know, if your kid got sick, you had to be with your kid. That's not something to apologize for if that's what made you late. Right? So it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It doesn't mean they owe you anything. It just means exactly what it should mean. Don't apologize because you're late. So thank you for waiting on me. Um, don't apologize for forgetting to make a phone call. Just when you talk to them again. Thank you for picking up. I can't believe I forgot last time. And go on with whatever you're saying. Don't say I'm sorry. Because the truth is, most of the time when we forget something, or when we're late, or when we come up short, it's not intentional. It's not because we're lazy. It's not because we think less of the people around us. It's not for any of those reasons. It's a legitimate thing that life just happens. And if we start treating that as opportunities to be thankful, instead of opportunities to be apologetic, we'll find our perception changing. So when life happens and we say, Thank, I'm thankful that God walked through that with me instead of, I wish I could see God walking through that with me or, or I wish God wouldn't make me do that. Instead, if we turn that into, a, I'm thankful. Thank you, Lord, for, for walking me through that. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the opportunity to see what you want me to see. You know, When we change that perspective, it changes how we view ourselves and it changes how other people view us. And so with that in mind, my perspective of rest is not a good one. <laughs> I just said, it just makes me um, feel that much more inadequate because it's that, that, that much more that I'm not getting to, that I'm not doing or that I'm not doing well. I don't like it. <laughs> but rest in actuality is a, is a weapon. It is a weapon of God. It is a weapon God gave to us to use. It is a blessing. Um, it is a unintentional side effect. St. Augustine said, because God made us for himself, our hearts are restless until they rest in him. So if we're restless, it's because we're not resting in him. We're resting in physical. Maybe if we're just sitting and resting, but we're not meditating on the scriptures or we're not worshiping or we're not talking to the Lord or we're not, you know, doing something that kind of puts us in his presence. Uh, not that I'm not saying that God leaves us at any point. I just mean something that doesn't put us in his presence, get our mindset in his presence. <laughs> Um, then we're restless. Then we're thinking, I've got too much crap to do. I cannot sit here and do nothing. I've got to get to this. I can't sit here and not do this because then that's not. But if I'm worshiping the Lord, none of that's coming to mind. I'm resting because my heart is going to remain restless if it's not in Him. 
And if I'm resting in him, that's never a bad thing. That's never, I never feel guilty if I spend time with God. I've never gotten up from prayer and been like, oh my God, I just lost 45 minutes. I've never felt like that. Um, I've never stopped praying and thought, you know, it's an hour and a half, I got to go get one of the kids. I've gotten up and just continued and moved into worship and played worship music while I drove to get the kids. I don't regulate my time with God. That's precious and that's wonderful and however long it takes is however long it takes. I don't feel bad about it. I don't, I'm not apologetic about that at all. But when I use it spending something else, doing something else, I'm very apologetic. I feel like I could have done it more. I feel like I should have done more. I feel like I should have done something else. I should have, put, you know, and so the rest that God gives is restful because he made us to be like him. He made us to reflect him. We, he made us in his very own image. He wants to see himself reflected in us, and he's not going to be reflected in us if our rest isn't found in him. We're going to be reflected with worry, of doubt, of fear, of judgment, versus the rest that makes us feel secure and makes us feel blessed and makes us feel close to him in some way. Our scripture that we're going to look at tonight is where rest is found to be twofold. It's found in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. It's very popular. Everybody knows it. <laughs> but we're going to look at it today because it's going to show us rest being twofold and a better perspective than how we typically take it to be in our life. So Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble and hard, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're going to look at verse 28 real quick, just all by itself. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The Greek word rest there means exempt from. So he's saying, come to me, who are weary and burdened, and I will exempt you from that. I will exempt you from feeling tired. I will exempt you from feeling burdened. I will exempt you from having to feel anything that the world has put on you. The only thing you're going to feel is me. Because I'm going to exempt you from having to feel that. That's why he got on the cross. He exempted us from sin. He exempted us from the punishment of sin. He exempted us from a fleshly life that's not productive. That's what the cross did. Jesus isn't saying, in this moment, come to me. He's saying, come to me literally with your life. Because my cross is going to exempt you from anything that should make you weary and burdened. Because a Christian who rests in the Lord is not burdened. They're not tired. They're not worn out. They're not looking for escape. Why? Because they came to Jesus, because that's what it's supposed to look like. So this, this rest that Jesus is talking about in verse 28 is given to us. It's a form of deliverance. I will deliver you from that life. That's the whole point of the cross, to deliver us from that life. We're going to be talking a lot about the cross in the upcoming months because Easter's around the corner. But, so to exempt us is a deliverance. It's given to us. I didn't ask for it. I didn't go running for it. Jesus did it. It's done. It's been handled. It was given and it's a form of deliverance. And then when we move on to verse 29, all by itself, it says, Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, this is the second time we see rest, and this is why this is a twofold verse. This rest in the Greek means recreation. This rest means um, that it is an activity of leisure that brings enjoyment or pleasure. So the first time you come to me, and I'm going to take away all your worries, I'm going to take away all the burden. And then after you do that, when you learn about me, the rest that you are going to find is enjoyable. It's pleasurable. It's nice. It's comforting. And notice this rest is found. He says, and you will find, my yoke is easy and my burden. And the first one, he says, I will give you. And in this one, you will find. Because the first one God gives to you, Jesus gives to you on the cross without any expectation of anything of you of the kind. But if you want to enjoy his presence, you've got to go find him. You've got to go to the cross. You've got to go and say his name. You've got to go in prayer. If you want to find the enjoyment part, you've got to learn about Jesus. You've got to look at your scriptures. You've got to learn to worship a little bit. You've got to change your perspective and start saying thank you instead of I'm sorry. You've got to do something to get the enjoyment out of rest. God's going to give you rest, but if you want to enjoy it and not have it impeded by anything, you've got to go find it. And it's found in Jesus. You have to know Jesus. It is twofold. It is given for your deliverance, and it is found in Jesus so that you can know Jesus. Now, the crux of the matter is, especially with me, and I feel like I have no exemption to the rule. I'm nothing special. I'm just like everybody else. The crux of the matter is rest is a trust problem. People who can't find rest don't trust that God's going to handle it. 
If I tell my boys to do something, and then I go behind them, and then I do it, I haven't had any rest. Why? Because I didn't trust that they were going to do it right, so I just did it myself. Right? Yeah. If I need God to move in a situation, and I don't rest in that, and I begin to try to do what I'm going to do and talk to the people I'm going to talk to, and then I'm not trusting God to do it, and I'm not finding any rest. I'm not finding that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I'm not finding that at all. And we'll say, well, I prayed to Jesus, but it's, it's not been handled. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I believed in faith, but nothing was happening. So I called Sister Bertha, and God heard her pray. And then I went up to the altar, and I got prayer there. And then I had this Facebook group, and I'm going, are you resting at all? When you prayed to him, did it stop there? And you rest in the promise that you are exempt from this life of burdens. Did you rest in him and know enough about him to trust that he was going to do what he said he was going to do? Or did you immediately say, I'm going to wish on him, because that's what a prayer is without rest. It's a wish, a hope. Anybody can do that. I'm going to wish that he's going to do it, and then I'm going to go ahead and do what I can do to make it happen. Are you resting? No, because you don't trust him. Because to trust God means you've got to learn to let go, and let go means you don't get any control. And um, that's not okay with me. <laughs> I need to know what we're doing. <laughs> I need to know when we're doing it, how we're doing it, how long it's going to take. <laughs> I need details. I can't just... There is, I love my husband to death, and, and I've said a hundred times I'd never remarry. I make snide jokes, but the truth is another man would never let me be as controlling as I am in my house. I am so, and it's not like, he can go out and play and not call me. I don't care. Do your thing. But it's, things have to be done a certain way. It's, this cannot happen. I cannot have you messing with my control. I will lose my ever-loving mind. He, um... I love my kids, and I'm a little bit overprotective. I will admit that. That's who I am. My kids are not terrible people because of it. My youngest is my baby. He's always going to be my baby. My youngest has some mental health that, that we've learned to deal with, that we're doing really, really well with. Um, I've learned a lot about my own mental health through counseling sessions with him. And, and so there's a part of me that's super protective because of that. And I couldn't go pick him up from school on Friday because the car was in pieces. Nathan was working on it. And so I said, I'm going to walk to the high school and meet him and walk him home. And Nathan was like, I cannot believe you were going to walk to the high school to get your 15-year-old son who can walk home by himself. And I was like, you don't get to tell me how to spend my time. If I were to walk to the high school 22 times, i walk to the high school. That's me and my kid. You, because guess what? I'd have control over Ben. I had to know that Ben was safe. I had to know that Ben wasn't freaking out. I had to know that Ben wasn't worried. I had to know that the routine didn't mess him up. I had to know that he had a good day. I had to know that he wasn't upset that he was something. I had to have control of this situation. If I sat at home and said, Lord, take care of my baby and rested in that, but I didn't trust God enough to do that, I had to have control of that situation. Prime example, I am guilty of it. <laughs> in little ways like that, I'm like that. I don't rest in God because I don't trust that he's going to do it. I feel like he expects me to do it myself. Because my whole life, I just think, fine, I'll do it myself. I don't care what it is. <laughs> I'll do it myself. I take that attitude with God sometimes. And it's a matter of me having control. And if I have control, then I don't have trust. And I'm certainly never going to have rest. I'm not going to have the rest that's found in him. And I'm not going to have the rest that he's going to deliver me from. And the biggest thing that we have to understand is if we can get over that issue, rest is God's weapon. It's a, it's a powerful weapon that God uses. We don't necessarily see it as a weapon because it doesn't seem offensive. It doesn't seem powerful. We don't, we don't have songs and stories where we look at the devil and we go, oh yeah, well I'm going to take a nap. We don't, we don't see stories like that. We don't see armies run up and go, and they all decided that it was time to sit down and play jacks. There's no stories about that. Rest is not an active thing, and so we don't see it as a weapon. The truth is it is because rest sets a tone. When you have the kind of rest that we just looked at, the, the kind of rest that delivers you, the kind of rest that gives you joy and freedom and peace, when you have that kind of rest, you have a peace about you, you have a calm about you, and Satan can't rattle your cage. You see, he's not coming in to kill people around you. He's coming in to rattle your cage. He wants you not to trust that God's going to handle it. He wants you to walk to the high school. He wants you to doubt that you're going to do that. He wants you to be busy. So busy that you forget to be thankful. 
So busy that you forget to see the opportunity. So busy that you forget your purpose here. So busy that you forget everything God's told you about you and you start to believe the lie because you ain't spend no time getting to know Jesus. You don't find pleasure and rest because you don't know who Jesus is. You're just listening to what Satan tells you because you're too busy to listen to what Jesus is telling you all along. You see, God is a weapon because Satan uses busy while God uses rest. We're supposed to rest while he works. We're supposed to trust while he goes. It's not our job. It's his job. I'm not saving people by the millions. God's doing that. I'm not supposed to rescue all of your sales. God's going to rescue all of your sales. I'm supposed to rest and trust in that. But as soon as I start deciding I need an army, and as soon as I start deciding I need people to start doing things, I'm robbing everybody of rest, and we're all getting really, really busy. That's Satan's playground. He loves that. The best weapon, the easiest weapon we have is to sit down and shut up. It's the best weapon we got. Satan can't torment somebody who's sitting in the presence of Jesus. Satan can't attack somebody who's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Satan can't come after somebody who's worshiping a God greater than him. He can't do it. And the only time we get to that in its full measure is when we're resting in him. To, to end it off with verse 30, it says, For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Jesus isn't saying when you rest in me, you do nothing. You're going to do something. Whether it's worship, whether it's serve, whatever he may speak to your heart in that moment. You're going to do something. His yoke implies that. But the word easy there, that Greek word easy means good and serviceable. For my yoke is service. It is good. And my burden is light. Because serving Jesus does not make you weary, it makes you powerful. And if you are in ministry and you are weary, I question who you're serving. Mm. If you are in ministry and you need a break and a sabbatical, who are you serving? Because my Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. I don't need a vacation from my Jesus' work in my life or yours. I don't need to relax and let God go do something without me. Who am I serving if I need a minute? Mm. I think if we're not... Because we're supposed to be resting in Jesus all the time. He's giving us a deliverance from the burden and enjoyment for the process. And yet we're not doing either. or We're doing one or the other or neither. <laughs> and then saying, I'm just doing too much in ministry. I'm just overwhelmed. Well, who are you serving? Because Jesus never asked you to do it. Right here he tells you, I'm going to deliver you from the stress of it. And I'm going to make you enjoy it while you do it. How much better could it be? Jeremy Taylor said, Christ's yoke is like the feathers to a bird. It's not loadful, but it helps the motion. The feathers of a bird don't weigh it down, but it's not going to fly if it ain't got feathers. So that's what makes it work, right? Do you want to fly? You got to rest first. That's probably part of the plan. But you're never going to know it if you don't partake in the rest and see the weapon that that is in your life and see the, the impact that can take. When you change your perception of what rest means to God and what he wants us to take home with us, it's a lot easier to say, every day I rest in the Lord. I get renewed every day. He says, your mercies are new every morning. Why? Because you've rested in him every morning. Because you've rested in him before you went to sleep at night. Because you took 20 minutes in the afternoon. That's why it's always refreshing. That's why it's always easy. Jesus ministered on this earth for three years. Now, the Gospels chronicle it, but we know beyond a shadow of a doubt they did not chronicle every day of his life. John Flattel says the things Jesus did were too numerous to list. And in the Gospel, John says, you know, none of us chronicled it all. There's, there's a bunch of stuff he did that we don't know about. They just probably did the highlights of the career. I don't know. Like the jump shots and the hook shots. I don't know. So knowing that, in three years, Jesus never walked away from the ministry. People were trying to kill him. They wanted to kill him. His life was in danger and he never said, this is too much, I need a break. Because Jesus was serving God and he rested in God every single day and got new mercies every morning. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why he came, was to show us. He was like, all right, they're a little too dense to get it, I'll just show them. <laughs> and so he came to earth to show us, this is how it's done. It doesn't have to be terrible. I don't think Jesus went around scared and, and crying and complaining all the time for all the opposition he faced, and he faced plenty. Why? Because he rested and trusted in God's plan. He knew salvation was coming to man, and that was so amazing that nothing could dim that. 
Nothing could change that. Nothing could rob him of that. He said, everything I do, I do because God told me to. If we're doing that, then we're not going to get weary. We're going to be able to fly because that's what rest is supposed to be. It's a recharge to be able to do the ministry. And you can do that while you're doing the ministry. You don't have to take a break. You don't have to feel like you're not doing enough. You don't have to feel like you're not measuring up. You don't have to feel like you have to step back from anything. You just have to remember to step in to him, into his goodness, into the, the pleasure that he's offering. Accept the exemption from the burden and enjoy the fact that he's got a purpose for you and that he's using you for that purpose. Lord, we are thankful for rest. We are thankful that no matter what we try to make things seem in our fleshly minds, Lord, that you can give us a fresh revelation, that you can give us a new illumination of your scriptures and an understanding of your word, the purpose you have for our lives. We're thankful, Lord, that you knew this life was going to be heavy laden. You knew this life was going to be full of burdens, and so you provided a way to exempt us from it all. Lord, I'm thankful that there's nothing more our heart wants than to be alongside of yours. There's nothing more our spirit wants than to sit alongside you, Lord, that to worship at your feet. Lord, I'm thankful. That every day we live in a country where we can do that anywhere and anyhow in any place that we want to do it. Lord, I'm thankful for all of the many ways you provide rest and that we can partake in that every single day and not grow weary. Lord, we just bless you and we're thankful for all of the power we can find in your God-given rest. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 <laughs>